Hey guys, do you have questions about using Y-DNA as part of your genealogy research? If you do, you're in the right place because I have Mary Everly of DNA Hunters with me today. And this is actually a replay where she talks about using the very starting at the beginning, the basics of using Y-DNA as part of your genealogy research. Now this is part one in this video and then be sure and after when you're done to watch part two as well. I'll have that linked in the description below so that you can catch the full scope of using the Y DNA as part of your genealogy research. You're going to learn a ton. I know I always do when I listen to Mary. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna go right into the replay of the live stream that we did. Sure, well, thank you, Lisa. And thanks everybody for being here today. Um, I'm going to do this in a two-part fashion. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about the basics of Y DNA testing, and uh, in light of family tree DNA, releasing some new tools uh, next time, which will probably be uh, early March. Um, I'll talk about the big Y test and what you can learn from that, as well as uh, at least one other new feature that they have. So uh, without further ado, I will present my Y-DNA part one. It's always interesting to hear the new things that are coming out. And this time of year with Roots Tech, they, most company, a lot of companies are announcing new features. Right. I just got an email this morning from them talking about these new features. And I, I had heard about them, mm -hmm. but I just, um, I, you know, all of a sudden it becomes like a lot of material and it's easier to split it into two. Um, so starting out with using DNA, excuse me, Y DNA for genealogy research, mm -hmm. you can use Y DNA to research your patrilineal line, meaning your father's 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 line. Uh, and when you when you use Y DNA, it can provide evidence to support that branch of your family tree. You can also use it to find someone. So a lot of times people are wondering who their great grandfather was on that branch or their great great or so on, or even their father. You can use it to find a surname. You know, so sometimes families know that their name got changed and they want to know um, their real surname, meaning their biological surname. And I think it also can be used to cause confusion. So I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But uh, just to say before I go on, you know, people will contact me and say, you know, I'm Joe Smith and I've done a Y DNA test. And boy, you know, either it's got the wrong surname, not Smith, or it's got five different surnames. So then it's then there is the confusion as to why that is the case. There are a couple of companies doing Y DNA testing. The first is Family Tree DNA, and they do full Y DNA testing. It's a separate test from their autosomal DNA test, which is called the Family Finder test. And their Y DNA test gives you your Y haplogroup and haplotype, which I'll explain in just a minute. And then it gives you information about your deep ethnicity estimates on that patrilineal line. So your father's 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 line. It also very importantly gives you Y DNA matches. And I say that's important because we need matches uh, in order to do the genealogical research that goes along with this. Switching over to 23andMe and also Living DNA, as part of their autosomal DNA test, they will provide your Y haplogroup. Um, that is, if you have a Y chromosome, they'll say it is this haplogroup, and I'll explain that term in just a minute, um, as well as your deep ethnicity estimate on that Y line for your direct paternal line or your patrilineal line. You know, so we have at least those three different terms to describe that father's 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 line. 
one thing I wanted to warn you about if you're comparing results from two different companies is that you can end up with two brothers who share the same father uh, having what appears to be different haplogroups. So on the top is my brother, uh, brother number one. And let's see, I'm gonna get a little, trying to pull up the little laser pointer. Uh, that, okay, here, brother number one. So he was the first one to test, uh, even before I tested. And he was told that his paternal haplogroup, meaning his Y haplogroup, is RL47. My second brother tested at Family Tree DNA, and they said that his predicted haplogroup was RM269. And this could lead one to think that maybe they had two different fathers because, you know, why is brother two this haplogroup and brother one that haplogroup? Looking um, at 23andMe, they, they give you a timeline. So this is from the L47 brothers results. And that points out that this L47, which is a subtype of R, uh, that it arose fewer than 10,000 years ago, and that it arose from this more general RM269, which is 10,000 years old. And that's what my brother at Family Tree DNA came up as. So this shows that uh, you know this is a more uh, basic group uh, that includes things like RL47, um, and you know that it, that this is consistent with them having the same father. Mm. It, we've got these uh, different different uh, levels of resolution at the two different companies, and and sometimes if you go back far enough these uh, haplogroups were named with uh, alphanumerics, meaning letters and numbers. And so for example, this might be R1, B1, uh, B2, A1, and, and so on. And that just became very complicated. And instead, I think everyone at this point has adopted this naming system. Mm. But if you're in the scientific literature or if you're looking at some older materials, uh, so let's say you tested your brother and you printed it out 10 years ago, it might still have that alphanumeric naming. And you can always go online and um, Google that alphanumeric to see what today it would be called. So here is where I finally explain what a haplogroup is. Um, and that is, it is a, a, a type or um, that's, I guess that's an unfortunate word because the next thing is haplotype. But basically it is where they're taking everybody. So all people with Y chromosomes and they're saying, oh, we can, there are these differences and we'll split them down into these groups. And the basis for this are um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And those are just individual places in our DNA that vary with in, within the population. So if we're looking at the Y chromosome and a really specific place on that chromosome, part of the population will have one DNA letter, so G, A, T, or C, and then a proportion of the, the population will have another letter. So let's say one group has A, one group has T, um, that would be a single nucleotide polymorphism. And that's 
the kind of testing that's used to form these haplogroups. There's another kind of DNA testing called short tandem repeats. And this is where uh, DNA is uh, in these short units that get repeated. So here we're talking about the Y chromosome and specific places within the Y chromosome where we've got these short tandem repeats. And this information gives you your haplotype. So um, I believe FTDNA is the only company that gives you your haplotype. So when I say two different kinds of testing, I mean at the lab. So one company, Family Tree DNA, has a lab and the lab does two different kinds of testing for the SNPs and the STRs. So I'll just illustrate uh, these SNPs. Uh, like I said, it's these little changes teeny tiny changes. You know, we have 3 billion base pairs or nucleotides and some of them uh, differ from person to person. And uh, this would be example of you. And then you might have another person. They also have a T here. Um, they have a C there. So if this were the full amount of DNA used to look at these haplogroups, we would say you and person one are the same haplogroup. But then we have person two who has four differences. So we've got one difference here, uh, a difference here, a difference there, and a difference there. So these little tiny changes are what, it, what is used to make these haplogroups. And there are 20 major haplogroups. Um, they are mostly named with letters. So that um, the example of my brothers, they both were R, the R haplogroup. Uh, and there's, you know, ABC uh, and so on. Down here, I have somebody with a haplogroup so it's an I broad group, and then this S 6270. And this person has been assigned to this haplogroup. And it talks about, um, this is a subtype of this broader I M253, and talks about roots in Northern France. So that's part of what I was saying, this deep ethnicity estimate. But remember, it's just on your father's, father's, father's line. So this uh, also is found within Viking and Scandinavian populations in Northwest Europe and has since spread to Central and Eastern Europe, where it's found at low frequencies. Haplogroup I represents one of the first peoples in Europe. You know, so that's some very, very deep um, ethnicity information, and it gives you an idea of where your ancestors over time could have existed or their relatives existed. Okay. This is from that same individual, so that with that confirmed haplogroup of IS6270. And confirmed is important because what they tell you with your test is um, your probable haplogroup. So if, you, if we go back all the way back to my brother's results at Family Tree DNA, it did not say confirmed. It just said probable. And with this person, we had him do some additional DNA testing. So he did the original, uh, I don't know if it was 111, I think it was 111 um, testing. And then he was trying to figure out who his father's father was. 
and somebody in a, a, a Y DNA project, so these are projects at Family Tree DNA, said it would help if you could further define this Y DNA haplogroup. group. So they paid for um, they paid for additional tests to be done. So the sample was there. Um, you pay money, they do some more testing with more SNPs. And uh, this was to be presumed positive based on that. This is positive, positive, and then negative. And it's just showing that um, these extra SNPs were tested. So this was tested, this was tested. Um, the 6270 is up here. And um, this, this little window, the StreamYard window is hiding it. Um, let me see if I can turn that off. Um, I've got a clear shot. I, I, oh, I see what you're... I would expect the 6270 to be green, but I can't see it. Can, can you see it? No. Oh yeah. Yeah. 6270. Yes. We can see it. It's green. It's, it's green. green. Okay, yeah. good. So he, he was showing that he had these additional uh, SNPs present and then he uh, 6270 was the last one that came up positive and that's why he's got this haplogroup. And that helped us. Um, we were trying to see if he, his father's father was part of this one family that had a specific surname. And the project administrator said, well, all of the Mr. So-and-sos are positive for this one SNP. Hmm. And in this case, the, the client wasn't positive. So he was more distantly related to these people than what we originally thought. So this, you know, this really helped. It helped in that it clarified the relationship to a group of men with the same surname. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately it excluded that, that family, um, you know, cause then you're kind of back to the drawing board of, well, okay, if it's not that, then, um, you know, where, who, you know, which, which branch does he belong to? Right. Okay. And this is how you're, you're able to add either individual SNPs. So if you're in a project and somebody says, you need to test this specific SNP, if there's a little basket, you can add it. Um, I guess here, this add goes to something maybe up above. Um, and, or a lot of times they offer SNP packages where they know that a certain set of SNPs go together and that set of SNPs are used to define a broader haplogroup. group. So, um, so it's just when you're looking at your results, you can see that and you're invited to add them to your test. Okay. So that's about SNPs and haplogroups. For haplotypes, this goes back to those STRs. And I just drew out an imaginary uh, STR where the, the unit that's being repeated is this GAG. And we have these repeats throughout our genome and most of the time, they're just some variability that's out there. And other times, sometimes they're associated with diseases. So, um, it, you know, in this, in these cases, it's, it's not the disease related ones. It's just things are these repeats that occur on the Y chromosome. And it will be at a specific location. And we've got here, we've got seven repeats. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This person would get a score of seven, whereas this person would get a score of eight. And typically these repeats are passed from father to child uh, 
without th this kind of a change. But that's not 100% true. So, you know, it gets a little imperfect, but, you know, it's biology, it's, it's not physics. Um, so you will get the certificate that tells you this, this is a blow up of it. It'll tell you, you know, for this marker. So this is an STR marker called DYS 390. This person had 22 repeats. At the next marker, uh, this person had 14 repeats. And, you know, you can, you can, uh, you know, what, what good is this, I guess, is the question. And that is, it's this information that leads to your match list. So going back to this, in your match list, you would have people who, and, and you were this person, well, your match list would consist of people who had seven of these repeats. And then if you ordered a, a 37, so it's called Y37 or Y111. So if you ordered a 37 test, you would have 37 of these, which would show up down here. And those 37 results would be what's used to match you up with other people in the database. Mm -hmm. If you did 111, then there are more um, STRs that add up to 111. And as you can imagine, the more you test, the finer your ability and, and the greater your ability is to find somebody who's biologically close to you. So you might have a Y37 test that comes back with, you know, a bunch of different surnames. Mm -hmm. And that's common in certain populations just due to their sociological practices. So for example, I see that with Irish people where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where names, surnames have changed for various reasons, like uh, clan affiliations, uh, where if you're affiliated with the clan, you might have one surname, even though biologically you're not related to each other. And for those people with a bunch of surnames in their list, if they go up to 111, then, their list might become much more specific, you know, so you might mm -hmm. end up just with the O'Neills. So that's, um, that is about finding your matches. Today, you can order a Y37 test for about 119. The Y111 test is 249. And then we also have the big Y700 uh, for four nine or 449. And this I will talk about more next time we, we get together. And that has um, more STRs and more SNPs. And it's able to tell relationships even better than the Y111 test. Mm -hmm. And I have a great example of that that I'll share with you next time. Can I ask a quick question? Tammy had a question oh, sure, in the Facebook sure. group. Do you want to take that or do you, is that, would you feel better about taking that toward the end? Do you think? Um, oh, I can take it now. Okay. So she's asking how common when you do the 37 marker, is it to match exact? Cause they're working on the big, getting the big Y done. How, how common, I think it just depends, you know, it's, it depends upon the people in the database mm -hmm. and you. So I've uh, probably mentioned this before, but I tested my brother at 67. Mm -hmm. So they used to also sell the 67 test. Right. And he had zero matches at the 67. So that uh, wasn't, well, that that led me to believe that, um, you know, he's, he's unique. Uh, <laughs> And uh, maybe someday he'll have some matches. Mm -hmm. And and then I dropped it because you can you can always look at what's your match list at a lower level. Mm -hmm. So I dropped it to 37 and he matched this man with a totally different surname. 
and only one man. And um, when I looked at where those two surnames came from, they were both from the same region of Germany. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that, you know, if we go back far enough in time, you know, somewhere these two families were connected. Gotcha. So, you know, in that case, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't super helpful, right? And he had virtually no matches. Um, and I've talked about the people who have, you know, five different surnames or 10 different surnames. Mm -hmm. um, and then this example that I now have on the screen is from a male adoptee looking for his birth father. And this was super helpful. This is at the 37 level marker. He had eight matches and I've, I've got uh, five of them on the screen. And what was really helpful is that with the exception of the second person, this guy, all of his matches had a form of the surname mm -hmm. Cannon. You know, so uh, probably a, uh, a German version, another German version. I think this is a German version too, with a different prefix. Um, I don't speak German, but I, I did ask my sister and she seemed to think that was likely the case. And then this guy who's just Mr. Cannon. And, um, you know, they're, they're listing their oldest known ancestors and here we've got a specific ancestor uh, who's Sterling Cannon. Here, um, the oldest known ancestor is von Kennen. So that, you know, that's interesting. And he's from Germany. It's almost this, this version of the name. Um, and another um, von Kennen. And, and in the end, this guy's birth father was Mr. Cannon. So, you know, that's not going to be true a hundred percent of the time, because if the, if there was a break in the Y line, um, he could have been, you know, Mr. Smith, but chances were that the birth father was going to be a Cannon or, so, you know, some version of it. And the um, family tree, showed that this guy had, he had his family tree with that blue icon and that this gentleman also did the family finder or autosomal DNA test. So I was able to see that, that he matched the adoptee on this autos, autosomal test as well. And in the end, uh, this was the second cousin once removed. You know, these, these people were likely more distant um, matches, or maybe they just remained in Germany and kept with the more German version of the name. You know, so, so if you end up getting results like this, it's amazing. You know, it's amazingly helpful. But like I said, it, it's not going to always work this way. You know, it's actually the minority of the cases where you've got such clear results. So I've, I just, I wanna quickly mention another case where a man's father was adopted, but the, the father was deceased. And so they were looking for the biological parents of the adoptee, which would be the adult child's grandparents. And because this was on a direct Y line, the person tested and he had one of those results where there were a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of surnames. And in the end, I, I did find the grandfather and the grandfather wasn't his, that his surname was not in the list. You know, so in that case, it, uh, you know, I, I knew the, you know, I mean, I kind of kept in my head these surnames as I was examining the autosomal DNA results. And um, it just, you know, it didn't help. So just wanna, just to, just to let everyone know, it's not always the silver bullet you, you hope for.
Right, right. Definitely not. <laughs> yep. So let's see. Um, when you get your results, it will say genetic distance. And here we've got one for the, that same set of five matches. And we're looking at 37 markers. And um, this just means that they're matching on 36 out of 37 markers. So this is where the differences are. We also are provided at Family Tree DNA this tip calculator. And if you click on it, so this would be your match list. If you click on it, it will tell you the percent chance that you can find a common ancestor uh, within so many generations. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one of the things that they, um, Family Tree DNA is announcing just today that they have an improved tip calculator. So I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I'm excited to see that. You know, but this this gives you an idea of, well, should I should I research, you know, this person's tree if if he has a tree, or maybe you have to build a tree for him. Um, going back eight generations, uh, there's over a 50% chance you'll share an ancestor. So if it's possible to go back eight generations, then, you know, I would say, yeah, go ahead. And um, it's worth investing the time in looking. But if it said, you know, you go back eight generations and there's only a 33% chance, then, you know, I would say, well, you know, it's probably not. And could, could you find somebody with a better percent chance? So... I'm looking forward to seeing what those tip improvements are. Me too, definitely. Yeah. So here's an example about you know the, how you can use it in real life. And in this scenario, we've got a grandmother with two husbands, and we've got you, someone who has a Y chromosome, and we have John who has a Y chromosome, and um, so you, the the two of you could do Y DNA testing. So let's say John is a known grandchild of Anthony. <clears throat> and if, if you end up, your results are that you are haplogroup M and John is haplogroup I, then you know that this evidence supports Adam being your grandfather mm -hmm. and not Anthony because that, that haplogroup is going down uh, father, son, father, son, and, you know, father, son, father, son. So this is evidence to say that you descend from the other grandfather. Okay. So just keep in mind that the Y test is only about your patrilineal line. It's not your entire paternal line. So if you have a research question about your father's mother, um, then Y DNA for you, on, on you is not going to help because you're getting that Y DNA through your father's father. And it can be helpful for deep ancestry, like those examples I gave about the French and the Vikings and the first peoples of Europe. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful for more recent ancestry, either finding a surname or finding a location. Um, I, I feel like, you know, sometimes we have these really difficult research questions in genealogy. And so for example, did my ancestors come from Ireland or England, or did they come from England or Germany? Looking at your matches and where their oldest known ancestor lived gives you information about the location, even if they might not give you information about the surname itself. Mm -hmm. And then it can answer some really specific questions like which man is the grandfather? 
Okay guys, I hope you found Mary's presentation on part one of her Y-DNA and using that as part of your genealogy research helpful. So I've gotten a link below in the description below, I have the link to part two because you definitely want to go ahead and catch her next video as well.